Good morning, everyone. A big welcome. I'm James Heimowitz, president of China Institute, and it's a delight to kick off this morning's program. I think we're in for a really special treat. Um, for those of you that uh, don't know China Institute, we were founded in 1926, so we're getting ready for celebrating 100 years of teaching about China, teaching Chinese, helping Americans to better understand China through its language, through its culture, through its art, through its history, and also now through its business practices. And um, one thing I can tell you is there's no shortage of lack of trust now. And everything that comes from China is viewed with a great deal of suspicion um, in the U.S. And, and frankly, across a lot of um, Western countries now. And what we hope to do is what I say, uh, shed light, not shed heat. And we've gathered this morning um, some really knowledgeable experts in an area that's very important both to China and to the world. And that's, of course, the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, as I said, a lot of what China do does is often viewed with a tremendous amount of skepticism. Sometimes that's warranted, but many times it may not be. And what I'm looking forward to this morning and this evening, for those of us joining us from Beijing, is a deep dive into the green aspects of the Belt and Road Initiative, which has gotten a lot of attention. You know, is China really doing um, something that's helpful? Is it completely in its own interest? Or is this really serving a, a need and filling a vacuum in countries that are in desperate need of sustainable development in terms of infrastructure? So you didn't uh, join this morning to listen to me. I just wanted to give a big welcome and encourage you all to sign up if you haven't um, to become our members. Um, but let me pass it over this morning now to Earl, Earl Carr, who many of you probably already know, who has just finished uh, compiling a book as a former economist and a consultant um, with tremendous background in this area. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Earl Carr, who will introduce today's panelists. Thank you so much, James. Appreciate your leadership in almost 100 years uh, with the China Institute, which is which is incredible. Uh, I also want to acknowledge um, Aaron, um, who played a very important role in, in spearheading this event, along with Jin Qing. Thank you so much for working on this. We know these events don't just happen, so appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, Jackson Ewing and uh, Inger Saratang briefly. Um, you all will have their bios. So uh, a short introduction, uh, Jackson Ewing, I've had the pleasure of knowing him uh, first when he was at the Asia Society as a senior fellow there, um, but he's currently a senior fellow uh, at Duke University. He's also affiliated with the uh, Kunshan University um, as well. I'd also like to introduce uh, Inger Sa Saratang, who is affiliated with the Green Finance Research Fellow. She's a deputy director there uh, with the International Institute of Green Finance. Welcome to you both. Um, and we are delighted to have this great um, uh, presentation. So we're gonna do a few things. We are going to do a survey um, to really get uh, all of you to have you participate and get, get a pulse of where you all are thinking uh, about the, the Green uh, Belt and Road Initiative. <clears throat> and then we're gonna have a discussion uh, with myself, Jackson, and, and Sarah. And then after that, we will open it up for Q&A. Um, so if you have questions, please make sure to put them in the Q&A um, box, and we look forward to answering them. Um, so first, I would like to go ahead and start the survey. So um, Aaron, if you can go ahead and start the survey. Um, and myself, Jackson, and uh, Sarah will continue to have a conversation to make the most of this time. I will um, stop the survey in about five minutes um, uh, to give everyone a, an opportunity. So Jackson and Sarah, you know, one of the things I love to do, and I, I would love to do this both in Beijing, uh, is talk to taxi drivers about a variety of different subjects and issues. And I would also do the same in the United States when I would take an Uber or a Lyft. How much would you say the average person in the United States actually knows about China's Belt and Road Initiative, initiative let alone the Green Belt and Road Initiative? And then for you, Sarah, you know, based in Beijing, what would you, what would you say the average person in China knows about the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. Um, I'll start with you, Sarah, because uh, you're up late in Beijing currently, uh, and then I'll go to Jackson. 
Uh, thanks, Earl. That's a very interesting question to get started. And also, like I'm uh, based in Beijing, so apologize. I'm not very uh, caffeinated at this moment, um, 9 p.m. Um, so about uh, what an average Chinese person knows about uh, Belt and Road Initiative and also Green Belt and Road, I would say like average person at least in Beijing, they would know a decent amount in all the policy briefing and all the daily news, uh, get their like daily news, uh, those from uh, the Chinese media on the BRI and they know China, uh, Chinese companies, especially those having their relatives working for Chinese companies and Chinese financial institutions, knowing uh, their um, uh, overseas activities in Africa and in other continents. Um, but about green BRI, uh, the concept was like officially introduced back in 2017, but the greening is also like a process. So I would doubt an uh, average person can say um, too much on the green elements. So that's my right. here. Thank you. Yeah. Jackson, in the United States, I think that my answer is somewhat similar to Sarah's in terms of it being a relatively specialized audience that's going to be digging deep on the sustainability and climate concerns and opportunities attendant to China's Belt and Road. Uh, but there are, I think, some revealing trends when we look at some of the media coverage in the United States of the broader Belt and Road. And I'm certainly no expert in this area. I'm actually cribbing from a project some of my students have done over the past year to look at that. Um, one of the things that popped out was that the media coverage of the BRI in the U.S. is much larger and more... Um, uh, more specifically targeting that initiative than in any other country in the world by volume. And that includes the recipient countries along the BRI, as well as other close observers, such as peer countries in Europe. Um, and I think that the nature of the coverage reveals in part the myriad ways in which we can conceive of and look at the BRI broadly. Much of this in the U.S. is through a lens of threat and competition, um, uh, you know, discussing the different ways in which China's outbound investments could have dual purposes for its geopolitical and even in some cases military reach. There are some heavy criticisms of the potential of debt trap diplomacy, as it's often called, in which China will uh, negotiate different sorts of loan and grant conditions and aid and investment conditions upon more vulnerable developing countries that will put those countries and their citizens in a disadvantageous position for years to come. Um, and then there is a whole narrative surrounding environmental decline um, and sustainability and, and climate challenges that include ways in which BRI infrastructure will affect critical ecosystems, will lock in, in some cases, decades of fossil fuel use into the future, um, et cetera. I think all of those lenses are... Um, are are legitimate, um, that they are grounded in realities um, and in the kind of multifaceted nature of, of China's BRI. What's more absent, really, I think, um, is the other side of that coin, which is that China is filling a vital infrastructure gap in many of these developing countries that was not being filled um, and continues in many ways to, to not be filled, certainly completely, um, by the Development Finance Corporation of the United States or its peer development finance institutions in other donor and investing countries, uh, such as Europe, as well as Japan, Australia, Korea, et cetera. Um, that it, that gap is also not being fully filled by the international multilateral development banks, many of which are Western backed and are vestiges of the Bretton Woods systems, World Bank, IMF in Asia, the Asia Development Bank, for example. Um, and that as such, China's movement into this uh, investment space 
um, it, it, to a greater extent than it has acted in this way before, is having positive impacts on road connectivity, rail connectivity, the building of ports and telecommunications infrastructure, the building of energy infrastructure, um, connecting different markets, um, and that this is a, now a major part of our kind of global uh, development finance landscape. Uh, and so when we're considering that as it relates to the, our topic of concern here today on uh, sustainability and climate, we need to consider the BRI as a major player and evaluate it alongside those other financing actors and instruments. Um, just on that notion of filling a gap, I, I thought it'd be useful to be able to share my screen and, and show a video, uh, a, a brief picture. Um, so this is the, uh, I had the, I had the opportunity to go to Jamaica in uh, in March, um, and I saw firsthand the largest four lane bridge uh, that is currently being constructed in Jamaica. Uh, it's being constructed over <clears throat> the Rio Minho uh, River in Clarendon, which is one of the provinces um, in in Jamaica. And I I think this um, photo is important for two reasons. One, um, as a young, I, I remember. When, when me and my father would travel to Jamaica, my grandfather would pick us up and we would arrive in Montego Bay and we'd have to drive around four hours to get to Mandeville. Um, however, with this new super highway that the, um, that the Chinese have constructed, that time has been reduced to an hour and a half. And this new bridge will actually be four, will be the largest four lane bridge and will play a really important role in reducing time from going from Kingston to Maypen by over just 40 minutes. So you can see for developing economies, you know, these are really important. And um, photo credit by Earl Carr. Always wanted to say that. Um, but uh, if we can go ahead and um, talk a little bit, Jackson, about um, bring us up to speed on the, the background behind the Belt and Road Initiative. We understand that the, the BRI is enshrined in China's constitution. We know that this, this is going to be a signature mark of, of President Xi Jinping, but can you give us a bit of color and context of, of you know, the history of, of, of Belt and Road for those who may be less familiar? Yeah, sure, Earl, and I'll be brief, and I'm interested in Sarah's take on this as well. Um, you know, my my main um, grounding answer there is, um, and there are multiple readings to take on this question, that the Belt and Road was not always intended um, to be a signature foreign policy pillar of, of China's outbound looking investment strategy or its kind of broader geopolitical and geoeconomic objectives. Um, it was discussed in the early 2010s and began to move towards being launched around 2013 um, under the guise of trying to connect China's near abroad in particular and to build different transportation and communication and cultural corridors uh, in that near abroad that would link different markets across Eurasia initially, um, and then move towards maritime linkages that bring South and Southeast Asia in particular into the fray. That has since expanded substantially to cover essentially the entire world, certainly expanding to Africa and Latin America, uh, as well as the South Pacific. Um, and I think the ambitions have gotten grander um, and, uh, and greater um, in terms of the volume of investment that would be flowing through the BRI um, and the place that it would hold in China's overall foreign policy priorities vis-a-vis -vis what other priorities might be. The thing that continues, however, to uh, make it a little bit difficult to assess is that while it has these kinds of uh, grandiose ambitions and it has uh, this historical kind of ambiguity, um, the BRI continues to be relatively lightly institutionalized. And what I mean by that is that uh, there are multiple ministries and agencies in China to say nothing of the major outbound policy development banks, um, as well as the state-owned enterprises and private sector entities that are involved in the actual um, execution of the, the projects. Um, which goes everywhere from underwriting and raising capital to 
to actually building and providing expertise and labor um, to insuring projects and many points in between. Uh, these are, are not kind of collected under a single administrative umbrella or in a single institutional home. Um, and partly as a result of that, uh, there is not a great deal of continuity across BRI projects. Um, they are relatively um, uh, independent of one another um, and uh, they have very different characteristics on issues of, uh, of kind of loan conditions or investment conditions and repayment schedules and even repayment forms, some of which will come in the you know, conventional form of, of capital or you know, debt and equity and others which will come in the form of things like export receipts of, of different kinds of raw materials and products that China needs. Um, and, and you also see um, different environmental impact assessments and standards, which is perhaps more germane to what we're talking about here today. Um, much of those distinguishing characteristics have primarily to do with the host country um, that's receiving these investments and these projects and that are positioned to um, carry out those kinds of environmental assessments and put this kinds of environmental stipulations on the projects themselves. Um, but without going too far down that rabbit hole, my main point is there's wide variance across BRI projects and activities, um, and that this isn't really institutionalized in a, in a kind of singular place in China. So that's kind of an interesting tension that defines the BRI. On the one hand, um, it is this you know, major foreign policy pillar, and on the other hand, it's kind of varied. And if some would even argue essentially a branding exercise that's not all that different from what China was doing prior to the BRI through its going out policy targeting Africa, you know, through its increasing investment that we've really seen since the 90s, at least in developing countries. And uh, my former colleague at the Asia Society Policy Institute uh, and a former uh, high level State Department official undersecretary of state for the Asia Pacific, Danny Russell, uh, has looked at all of these factors and uh, used a term that I, I now like and borrow from him, which is to say that the BRI is a Rorschach test, um, which refers to that psychological evaluation where you see an ink blot on a piece of paper and you evaluate what it looks like to you. So you can look at the BRI um, and come to many different conclusions about what it is and what it isn't. Thank you. Um, Sarah, what standard or criteria would can best help us to measure if the if the Green Belt and Road is ultimately successful in the short term defined by a year, midterm defined by three years, or long term defined defined by 10 years. Put in another way, you know, if if GR if if the Belt and Road were to be successful, what would that look like and what would failure look like? Um, I think like to answer this question, which is very like thought provoking, I want to like flag three elements that can help us to structure like indicators to measure short, mid uh, and long term success and failures look like for a green BRI. Uh, so first is the policy uh, from the policy end, like um, China has their like top uh, down approach to shift the finance from dirty to clean projects uh, for the BRI. So the commitment, for example, uh, last year's uh, president's cease patch to no longer build coal-fired power plants abroad and uh, increasing um, support on clean energy for other developing countries. So that is one of the examples and very important movement uh, from China's top level to help BRI countries get closer towards their um, respective climate and biodiversity, uh, biodiversity targets. Like for example, on the climate change end, um, BRI countries, mostly developing countries, they have their own pledge under the Paris Agreement. They have their own nationally determined contributions. So China's um, one of the policies issued this year, uh, I think both Earl and Jackson are aware of from the uh, NDRC and the other uh, three ministries. Um, they uh, they, uh, they um, included 
this like Paris aligned um, bit in this announcement and uh, in this policy document. So this is a very um, positive signal. So this is on the policy end. Um, one of the indicators we can um, we can see from there is. Um, how helpful China's BRI has been um, doing to help um, uh, the other BRI countries to getting closer uh, to achieve their um, Paris um, targets and their like post twenty twenty biodiversity targets. Um, so that is one of the one of the targets uh, we can think of here. Um, and the and the second one would be the um, project level um, targets. So one of the shifts from Chinese um, end is to structure, um, is to like instruct uh, Chinese companies and financial institutions to going beyond the host countries' roles because like most uh, developing countries, they have a very lax um, environmental law and uh, regulations, meaning like to get the uh, land permit and to get the EI permit there um, doesn't require um, much of the effort from Chinese companies. But what China has been encouraging um, from Beijing here is to asking them to uh, think of to comply with international best practices and also Chinese standards, uh, whichever is more stringent. And uh, that kind of shift, this kind of like project level environmental and social risk management um, angle uh, from here, we can think of like on a project level, uh, not from like a, a BRI portfolio level, on a project level, if there are uh, any environmental and social benefits uh, these BRI projects are bringing to local communities, to local ecosystems, and a failure will look like um, if it is disrupting local uh, communities, indigenous people's lands, uh, disrupting local bi biodiversity is protected uh, areas, key biodiversity areas, etc. Uh, so that is a second lens. And the third lens is on green finance, which we can discuss in depth later on. Wonderful. Thank you for that. That's, that's very helpful. Um, I'd like to take a moment and go through the survey uh, results, uh, if we can. Um, if we can put those up, um, would love to see those. I'm going to end the poll now. Um, and if we can just go through those. Um, can everyone see the, uh, I'm going to share the results. Um, just want to make sure everyone is able to see those results. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and keep talking. Um, so first, um, what interests are you, what interests you the most about the Green Belt and Road Initiative? Um, the vast majority, uh, we have, wow, quite, a, quite a, a, an interesting mix, but about 22% said comparison of infrastructure investment strategies. Um, we've got the highest, 26% of GBR, Green Belt and Road Policy Dynamics and Future Trends. That was interesting. Um, we'll look at question number two. Um, do you think that the Belt and Road Initiative is a geopolitical effort or a profit-seeking agenda led by China? Overwhelmingly, we have 74% saying a mix of both. Okay, that's, uh, that's, that's quite interesting. Question number three, how do you perceive China's increased economic engagement globally? Um, highest answer is 30% saying not sure and about 26% saying um, viewed positively. For question number four, how do you perceive U.S. increased economic engagement globally? We have the highest percentage, 37%, not sure. And then we also have uh, about 22% saying conserved, uh, concerned, followed by 19% uh, not concerned. Question number five, and our... Do you think the environmental protection goals in the Green Belt and Road are a potential area that the US and China can collaborate on? 74% said a resounding yes, um, which is great. I think that's, that's great that we, uh, we see clear consensus that this is an area where, where uh, the United States and, and China can and should collaborate on. Question number six, our final question. Which country do you think will do more to reduce global carbon emissions by 2030 
56% said the United States, 44% uh, said China. Okay, so not, uh, you know, relatively, relatively close. Um, as uh, some great, uh, great uh, questions and also great dis uh, answers that we can incorporate into our, our, um, our discussions. Uh, we also, we already have two Two questions. So I just wanted to uh, remind all of you, get your questions ready. Feel free to put them in. We'll, we'll, we'll start the Q&A at a roughly around 9.45. Um, Jackson, I wanted to come back to you on a question. Um, when you, you know, when you have previous administrations like, like President Trump that have in so many ways de-emphasized uh, climate change uh, and the critical role of, 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 of the environment, and then you have presidents like President Biden that are trying to reassert American leadership uh, in this in this area, um, but at the same time you've had regions uh, like like the Europe that have you know for decades historically been very consistent in focusing on on environmental reforms. How can the United States reassert its leadership on issues like ESG and the environment and and be viewed as credible? Yeah, thanks, Earl. Um, I, I absolutely think that the United States record on international climate creates accountability concerns. And it doesn't just begin with President Trump, um, the uh, administration of President Clinton and Vice President Gore were instrumental in negotiating the Kyoto Protocol in the late 1990s. Uh, which then the U.S. was never ultimately able to ratify um, in, in the Senate, um, and that was moved uh, away from during the administration of President George W. Bush in the 2000s. Uh, I should also mention that this is not a purely partisan issue in the United States. Um, we've seen widespread reticence from both de Democrats and Republicans um, in Senate and the House to sign towards signing on to major international climate change commitments on behalf of the United States. And one of the constant refrains that uh, took place in particular prior to the Paris Agreement, which currently governs much of our international climate uh, diplomacy and, and action, was that if the U.S. were to sign on to constraining climate commitments that were targeting primarily developed countries, which the previous regime was focused on, um, the previous international climate regime, I should say, not individual U.S. administration, um, and China and India in particular, but other large developing countries like Indonesia or Bangladesh or Brazil, uh, were not, that that would both put the U.S. at a comparative disadvantage economically and strategically uh, in relation to those countries, particularly China, uh, and would not actually solve the climate problem because the emissions growth trajectories and potential of those large developing countries would not uh, be consistent with international climate goals. Uh, China, for its part, um, responded to that criticism by saying, look, historical emissions are largely the responsibility of countries that have already been through heavy industrialization periods, such as the United States, such as Europe, um, to a different extent, such as Japan. Um, and we have to prioritize development and poverty eradication. Um, and those are, are really kind of our, our core priorities, and we're not going to let climate change commitments get in the way of that. Um, this isn't our mess to solve. This is your mess to solve. Um, and we want to see first mover actions on behalf of the United States um, before we enter into anything that could curtail uh, or materially impact our ability to you know, improve the lives of our population. Very understandable position. Um, and this has shifted somewhat under the Paris Agreement regime. And, and I was in Paris for those negotiations, uh, along with many that have preceded it and succeeded it. Um, and uh, the kind of fundamental shift is that now all countries, regardless of whether where they are on the development continuum, bring their climate targets together voluntarily. Um, they create them in a way that meets their own national conditions. And those commitments are then aggregated, um, measured uh, through international processes, and ultimately um, called upon to be ratcheted up 
on a regular basis of, of review and a kind of ratcheting up of ambition. And this, I think, jibes with both the U.S. and China's intended um, climate international climate regime of, of being kind of less constraining on its own behavior. And I think that that dovetails with a real kind of convergence between the U.S. and China during the, the period of the mid 2010s in which we saw between 2014 and 2016 kind of on either ends of the of the 2015 Paris Agreement, a series of three bilateral agreements between the US and China, uh, all of which mapped out different kind of cooperation paradigms um, and uh, even declared some quid pro quo type climate targets. Uh, much of this was eroded uh, during the presidents uh, during the, the, the presidency of, of Donald Trump, um, who uh, early on uh, declared his intention to withdraw from the Paris Agreement uh, because of the way the Paris Agreement was created. It required neither congressional approval from the U.S. Uh, and also uh, had uh, stipulations in place that made withdrawal take a lot of time. Um, uh, essentially the entire duration of President Trump's first term. Um, and so that never had uh, a, you know, a great material impact in terms of the U.S. Um, official withdrawal of the, the Paris Agreement. Essentially, Trump was able to do it late in his administration by immediately upon taking office, brought the U.S. back into that agreement. Um, but Trump was able to, and any U.S. president and kind of uh, federal administration was able to essentially ignore um, U.S. commitments like funding uh, through the Green Climate Fund for climate mitigation and adaptation developing countries, was able to ignore U.S. climate commitments uh, to mitigate our, our own emissions here in the United States. Um, that didn't mean that those emissions stopped declining or moving in the ways that they were moving, um, but it was not a priority by the federal government to meet those targets, and that was stated explicitly. Um, so this obviously begs the question of, well, what happens next if we were to get another administration that was more adversarial towards those sorts of climate commitments in the future, which is certainly scenario, um, what would that mean for the future of U.S. behavior? And the, the world watches this, including China. Um, and and says, can we really depend on you to follow through on the commitments that you say you'll follow through on? Um, and at a federal level, I think that's a very understandable and almost inescapable question. Um, the one saving grace that I'll say, and I'll conclude here about this legitimacy problem, and I think this was observable during the Trump administration, was that uh, the kind of intentions of a given Congress or of a given presidency are not the only major driving factors in the U.S. emissions trajectory or environmental performance or strategy for uh, infrastructure development abroad. Um, companies have their own targets and their own um, sorts of considerations, uh, and we've seen a major rise in large corporations in the United States committing to net zero emissions by mid-century. Uh, we have uh, commitments by many of those same companies to try to uh, pursue net zero and other environmentally sustainable objectives in its supply chains. I'm not suggesting that will easily be done, but the fact that those are um, publicly declared commitments and goals is in itself important. And we also see subnational political actors like the governors of high population, high economic activity states, like those in the Northeast and the Eastern Seaboard and California on the West Coast, as well as the mayors of major cities um, in countries around the United States, which collectively represent large portions of population and GDP captured in the U.S., also moving against the Trump on the Paris Agreement, saying essentially we're still in, we're going to continue to try uh, to per pursue this more sustainable low carbon pathway. Um, so similarly, uh, in the future, uh, we could see many of those actors also um, you know, uh, have a, a real influence on the actual outcomes of U.S. environmental performance. Um, and I think that uh, if we if we just observe this coldly by the numbers, U.S. Uh, emissions continue to to decline um, during the Trump administration, not because of public policy, but largely because 
of things like uh, cheaper natural gas uh, and the replacement of coal-fired power stations by natural gas, coal, you know, natural gas power production, et cetera. Um, just a, an example of the ways in which it's a complex system with many levers uh, and a presidential administration only has so much control over that. Thank you so much. Sarah, I want to come to you. China has announced penalties for continuing to finance coal overseas. And many argue that uh, China also doesn't provide transparent information on BRI pipeline to outside observers. Give us a bit of color and context. Is, is there truth to that? How, how, do we, how, do we, how do you respond to that? Um, sorry, um, I'm not a like, legal expert, but uh, I think like on, to answer this question, like the first question we can think of is, is it on Chinese ground to penalize um, the overseas activities or is it up to the host country legal system and governance system to penalize those kind of activities? So that's one of the questions I just wanna throw out to our audience. Um, and also just as mentioned um, in the policy guidelines I just mentioned um, issued in March, um, there is a very clear reiteration of uh, President Chinese President Xi's last on the um, pledge of no longer building a coal-fired power plants, which is clearly um, not aligned with our 1.5 Celsius uh, temperature increase um, Paris aligned future. So there are three phases uh, of coal-fired power plants for those projects having not entered uh, construction. Um, it is encouraged to uh, get a full on stop. So like no longer proceed those projects. For projects under construction, which is like existing projects, which is uh, already announced and already constructed halfway, uh, halfway um, they uh, Chinese companies should proceed with caution. And for the installed uh, co-fired power plants, um, um, the policy encourage, uh, encourages Chinese companies currently op operating those to explore uh, cost-effective and feasible technological solutions such as uh, CCS, carbon um, capture and storage retrofits for those um, power plants. So there are clear guidance on the uh, uh, clear guidance considered as like soft law um, from Chinese end to regulate or like to encourage and discourage uh, certain BRI um, activities for Chinese companies. And also it is um, beneficial to look at the latest two official uh, regulations from China to regulate uh, both Chinese domestic and overseas uh, activities. One is for the uh, Chinese SOEs, uh, the government-owned enterprises. So for the companies which are uh, SOEs are major actors in uh, the BRI. And also another one is on the uh, financial institutions, including both banking and insurance. So we have the latest two policies um, here just issued uh, this, this month, uh, last month. So one is from uh, the regulator for government-owned enterprise to improve um, the um, SOE's ESG risk management and ESG disclosure. They should, those companies, uh, especially listed, uh, should strive to get all um, on, on board by 2023 for the ESG risk management and disclosure. So that is for the company level. And for the financial um, level, the China Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission, which is the regulator for China bank, uh, Chinese banks and insurance, which also covers the um, the major um, financiers, uh, for example, ICBC, Bank of China, those commercial ones, and also the policy banks and policy insurers like uh, the Exxon Bank, the CDB, China Development Bank, and the uh, Sinosure, the policy insurer. Um, the newly released uh, green finance guidelines ask 
banks and insurers to increase support for the green, low carbon and circular economy, prevent environmental, social and governance risks, and include ESG requirements in their management processes and comprehensive risk management. Um, ESG disclosures um, improve relevance like uh, banking and insurance level um, policies, mechanisms, and uh, um, and et cetera, to basically increase the green shares in their portfolio and divest from uh, from the brown assets. So that's the just from that policy. So like we can see from both ends for the companies which are actually going out to do the EPC services, to doing the uh, constructions in the host countries, they are asked to increase their ESG performance to uh, enhance their risk management on both sides. And um, for the financing side, for the financial institutions, they are asked to no longer uh, finance those, um, to divest from those like dirty assets, uh, which is no longer just limited to co-fired power plants, but maybe gradually shifting towards other fossil fuels. So those are the two um, considered like domestic uh, policies that have the overarching uh, influence over these companies and FIs overseas activities. So that's my two cents on this question, why there's no penalties. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that very comprehensive. All right. So we've got two minutes left. I've got one last question. Then we want, I want to open it up to the Q&A. We've already got a number of questions from our very esteemed uh, panels, and, and there's a lot of knowledge and, and, and um, great questions there. Last question to Sarah and Jackson, and, and I would just kindly ask you to, to try to make this response brief so we can get to as many questions in, from the Q&A. How can we better fundamentally incentivize the, the private sector, academia, nonprofits, and governments to work more collaboratively, co collaboratively in forming public-private partnerships uh, between the United States and China to further the cause of the Green Belt and Road projects in the midst of a very acrimonious geopolitical inflection point. Um, you saw James already talk about that earlier in his remarks um, to each of you briefly. I'll, I'll dive in and apologies for being so long-winded. I would love to say that's not a normal thing for me, uh, but I would be lying. Um, so I will try to be brief here. I would say double down on some of the existing institutions that have real legitimacy in, at the nexus of the US-China relationship. The China Institute is certainly a great example of that. Um, Council on US-China Relations uh, would be another. And then research institutes um, such as those which exist at places like UC Berkeley, Georgetown, between Duke University, Duke Kunshan. Um, these are all places where you have Chinese and American and other international researchers working together very pragmatically to try to solve some fairly technical problems um, and to find some opportunities. Uh, and to the extent that those can, can bring in private sector opportunities uh, for investment and project development, all the better. And secondly, I would just say look for a low-hanging fruit. There are going to be some sectors that are largely no-go zones, those with dual purposes, for example, uh, for, for military use. And you might have some real problems with telecommunications infrastructure, et cetera. Um, but more technical collaboration on things like building out China's national emissions trading system or renewable energy portfolio standards, as well as in the private sector, you know, particular um, technologies are going to be less politically sensitive than others. Um, so look for avenues such as those to collaborate um, between the two countries and internationally. Okay, wonderful. Sarah, real quickly. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, one one country I wanna flag, and also like one um kind of like unique uh, agreement I wanna flag is the like third party um cooperation agreement. So like China and other like um not other China and advanced economies uh, such as France and uh, the UK, um they have signed uh called like third party market cooperation agreements to like jointly 
uh, uh, explore creative like co-financing and co-investment mechanisms in emerging markets, uh, for example, in Africa, and to like unlock this like triple win uh, model. Uh, so by as of like June. 2019, that's the latest status updated by NDRC, uh, 14 countries have signed such agreements. So I just want to uh, also flag one country, France. Um, they, on the one hand, they are one of the funding countries for the uh, EU's Global Gateway Initiatives, which is um, kind of considered as an alternative for China's BRI. Um, so that is uh, one of the role of France there. And on the other end, um, uh, the uh, third party uh, cooperation agreement uh, has been signed by France as well uh, in June 2015. And it's the first of its kind of this of such uh, agreement. So um, for this year, for last year, um, France also like signed uh, no, this year. For this year, France also like agreed upon a list of uh, projects they want to um, co-export with China to collaborate in emerging economies. So maybe um, U.S. can um, kind of like replicate this model to kind of like do a co-financing um, projects with China to explore like how to combine the benefits uh, from the U.S. very sophisticated financial markets, very sophisticated understanding of capital markets and understanding of like innovative financial instruments uh, combined with Chinese like um, kind of like leading role in the green finance. It's very large issuance of green loans and um, Chinese investors um, very enthusiastic about um, Green, uh, green bonds. So those two can be combined to kind uh, to um, explore new opportunities for the emerging markets. Thank so you so much, much, Sarah. On green finance, that's I think the common ground for wonderful both China and the U.S. Thank you, um, Jackson. I put a copy of our book uh, link for the audience and wanted to kick off with our first question from Yanan Liu. Um, she asked, how many respondents do we have in the survey? Um, you know, we can, we can get that to you uh, at a later time. And her question is, how could the U.S. and China kick off cooperation and collaboration ar around Greenbelt and Road projects? Jackson, want to take that one? Well, I will, but I have to say, I think Sarah's answer just now or, or statement was far richer and more beneficial than anything I'm going to say. I, I wanted to stand up and cheer. I think that's exactly right. Um, I will just mention one thing here. I was interested that 74% of the respondents saw this as an avenue for uh, potential collaboration. Um, I was at a, a private session at the most recent uh, UNFCCC meetings in Glasgow this past November um, when we were discussing some issues of international climate finance and, and one major player in this space also um, pointed out that this is a potential area where collaboration could take hold amidst a, a more fractious overall relationship. I'm uh, hopeful, but uh, I see a lot of barriers there, frankly. Um, and uh, I think that a couple of, of thoughts are, are warranted about what the nature of such collaboration is likely to take and is not likely to take. Um, what I do think is likely is collaboration um, between the Western multilateral and international multilateral development banks and Western development financial institutions, that is the kind of state lending apparatuses um, of U.S. and European Canadian country, countries such as that, for example, um, and the AIIB, the Asian International Infrastructure Bank, um, because they have in their organizational DNA uh, a mandate to collaborate with these international players and, and a history. And they're a relatively young institution, but have multiple examples already of co-finance with these sorts of, of actors and also a commitment um, towards preferencing um, projects uh, that have uh, some environmental and climate benefit or, or uh, consideration built into them. Now, the 
record is mixed. It's not perfect. Certainly, um, few things are. Uh, but there, I think collaboration is is all you know is existing and is is likely to continue. Um, also, the kinds of uh, sort of financial product issues and uh, private sector and even you know to some extent maybe SOE uh, to other corporate uh, investments that Sarah has just mentioned. Likewise, you know, great opportunities for collaboration. But when we look at high volumes of Chinese investment from the XM Bank, the Export Import Bank, and the China Development Bank. At this point in the U.S., and, and I honestly don't see this this changing in the foreseeable future. Um, collaborating in kind of dual finance with those uh, organizations is a non-starter. Um, it's it's not going to, I think, happen in a meaningful way um, from U.S. DFC uh, or from the major international multilateral development banks. I, I could be wrong on that, um, but that's a place where I think um, it, collaboration is going to be more difficult. Thank uh, you. I would also just add, sorry, last thing, you know, collaboration is great, but we also have the opportunity for some virtuous competition here, right? Um, can we find a race to the top for the provision of infrastructure that these countries are, are requesting and, and demanding um, that can have these positive social and environmental outcomes? Again, I'm not trying to suggest that's a panacea or that's easily done. Um, but it's also an, an avenue where the two countries through their supply chains, through their production capabilities, through their applications of finance can co can, excuse me, can compete um, in ways that lead to positive outcomes for the recipient countries. Thank you, Jackson. Uh, I'd like to take a question from Abdullahi. Um, moving to the continent of Africa, um, there have been talks about uh, among sub-Saharan African borrowers that China is open to renegotiation and changes to loans once borrowers contest the initial terms. This is not so with Western lenders. What are your views on this? Um, Sarah, do you wanna take that? Uh, you know, Sub-Saharan African lenders and lending in, in, uh, in the continent of Africa. Um, the DSSI, the debt service um, sustainable initiative, they has been mentioned for several times and it has been initiated for a while. And it has been like included in the comic for several times, but it's, it's, there is nothing like fruitful coming from those like words. So coming from those initiatives. So I wonder if Jackson has other views on why Western lenders, the especially the Paris Club, hasn't having any um realistic of uh, that that uh, renegotiating and reconstructing uh, for the SSA. Yeah, I tried to answer that actually typed in the chat. Um, I, I, well, it's not a great answer, um, but essentially, I think we do see great rigidity um, in many of these multilateral development bank lenders. And the reason for that is to keep standards in place, right, that are fairly uniform um, and that uh, and that kind of have that foundation of of social and environmental and economic and loan characteristics that prevent problematic outcomes. The, the problem is that that can overly bureaucratize processes. It can lead to lending structures that are not that consistent with the desires, particularly of local and municipal governments, and local communities. So it's not as nimble. It's not as bespoke as a Chinese approach that's going to be more vert vertically integrated. All right, we're bringing some personnel, some leadership from key ministries. We're bringing leaders of key SOEs. We're bringing the insurers. We're bringing the underwriters. We're coming here and we're going to hammer out some deals that are going to really speak to how you conceive of your own national and subnational infrastructure needs. Um, and, you know, we'll do that in this location, then we'll do it again in that location. And those conversations will be quite different. So, you know, both, I think, approaches have strengths and weaknesses. Thank you. Um, we have a, a question from an anonymous attendee who would like to ask, you know, why, if this is a green initiative, does China continue to maintain the highest rate of pollution? Um, how to how to how to make sense of that contradiction? Yeah, I tried to answer that in the chat as well. Um, you know, it's just important to note that China's overall greenhouse gas emissions are the largest in the world by a significant margin, roughly almost twice the U.S., which is second. But its per capita emissions are much lower than that in the U.S., much lower than that in many European countries, but not all, much lower than countries like Australia or Singapore or Canada 
Um, and so, you know, part of China's international pollution, greenhouse gas emissions pollution record is a function of its large population and its large economy. Um, so, uh, yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll defer to what else I wrote in the in the statement there. OK, thank you. Um, I'm going to try to take two um, two additional questions so we can get to as many as possible. Um, Sarah, I'd like to address this one to you. Uh, this is from Beatrice uh, Fabian, who, who writes, if China continues its already started coal fired projects without penalties, how does that reduce their carbon emissions? The U.S. has stopped the building of coal fired projects, but we are still considered the big polluters. Um, just as I mentioned, for already started coal-fired projects overseas, it is, um, for example, there is a Bangladesh um, coal-fired power plant project, which was like revoked from China Action Bank to continue financing those. So that is one very positive signal uh, from there. So it can be stopped. And um, also for the already constructed um, projects, as I just mentioned, it is encouraged to uh, consider to, uh, to apply uh, CCS and other technologies that is cost effective and feasible at this moment uh, for Chinese companies to kind of like reduce the carbon emissions for the um, already operating, uh, for the already on the ground um, power plants. And um, um, just taking this uh, kind of like forward um, for coal power powered um, co-fired power plants, um, early retirement, it has to uh, incur some financial costs uh, for those to stop before the intended uh, end line uh, for those projects. So where those financing comes from is one of the questions we should think of. Uh, should the host countries, uh, should host country governments to kind of like put their money to stop those projects from running? Should Chinese um, kind of like chime in to put the money to help uh, those projects early retire? Or the MBBs or the uh, GCF should put their money to um, for those to realize, for example, the um, Indonesia and uh, other high um, reliance on co-developing um, countries, which are also um, BRI countries, they got the deal from the multilaterals to help them um, to transition from um, coal to clean energy much early on to help them uh, reach the early retirement. So that's uh, what multilaterals can do uh, for those not very financial viable projects. Mm, thank you. Um, Jackson, I'd like to give this question to you from Martha Kamara. Referring to the earlier mentions of debt trap, how are the priorities of local communities incorporated in the green finance process? Wow, that's that's a difficult one. Certainly, um, I, I think that there are um, instances where those development outcomes are, are strongly considered, and in fact, embedded in the thinking behind the investment itself. Uh, if we think of this from a larger rung of the host government's perspective, the idea would be that they could um, improve the, the lives and conditions of local communities, not only for those human development impacts, but because that would grow their economy and grow their tax revenues and grow their economic base, which would then in turn be part of the foundation for paying back the loan over time. So I think on a certain level that is embedded um, within the entire kind of investment arrangement. Um, but that's when it, you know, that that takes hold when it works well, and it obviously doesn't always work well. Um, so here you get into the importance of consultation, I think, with affected communities and with local governors and, and local civil society organizations. Um, and I'll only say one thing about that, which is and Boston University's Global Development Policy Unit um, has done a lot of work on this. When we see a financier concern with those kinds of social development, environmental outcomes, but the lack of local engagement on them, we see poor outcomes. When we see local engagement and concern on those sorts of issues, but poor financier 
we see poor outcomes. It's really when we see a combination of financier and local impact assessment, local review, local consultation, that we see strong positive outcomes. Sarah, did you want to add anything before I, I jump into another question? Um, I very much echo on Jackson on this. Nothing to add on from me. Okay, great. Um, we are going to, um, I know it's 10.01. We're going to do, because the, the questions are so great and we, we've got an additional questions, we're going we're gonna to ta uh, take a few more and, and to wrap up at 10.05. Um, and so one of the other, and then we'll have uh, James come and kind of close us over here. Um, we have a question about um, uh, the, the massive protests in Sri Lanka that have erupted in response to environmental harms and the, the 99 year lease over the Hambantoto port. Um, also, there have been other issues with uh, the Kenya environmental groups in Kenya that have brought up concerns as well. How do we reconcile these issues of both um, you know, green finance as well as the, the, the social aspects of, of, of meeting communities where they are? Look, I, I'm not the best person to speak to Hammond Tota um, or the situation in Kenya. There are far more informed people on those issues um, than, than myself. But with that caveat, um, I, I will say that um, in Sri Lanka, I think you had a convergence, uh, and this is from my Sri Lankan friends telling me this, of uh, a heavy government corruption um, dovetailing with uh, you know, a Chinese sense of opportunity for key port infrastructure that could have dual use um, for both business, commercial, and, and military um, uh, benefit in the future, leading to an arrangement that was not in the interests of the local population in a number of ways. And so that's kind of a failure of that consultative uh, human development interested approach uh, that I think Sarah and I both just endorse. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Jackson, we have another, we have a question from Ivana Lukaku. How do you see the position of smaller countries um, being able to collaborate with, with China, particularly on you know, the, the Belt and Road and the Green Belt and Road? Um, do you think it is possible to, for these smaller countries to be cooperating with China um, versus kind of, you know, may, and I think she's specifically talking about countries, smaller countries uh, in, in the Caribbean and in Latin America that are kind of viewed as in the sphere of, of the U.S. influence. Are they able to cooperate with China on, on things like the Belt and Road being so located geographically so close to the United States? Yeah, my, my reading is she was actually asking about Central Europe um, uh, and the, the B4 countries in Central and Eastern Europe, but same, I think the same thing pertains there, Earl. Uh, I, I typed a brief answer, so I'm curious about Sarah's opinion. You know, can these recipient countries balance between the U.S. and China? What does that look like? Um, from my read, like um, Chinese BRI or like the Green BRI initiative tactically, it is shifting towards a more like demand driven and the increasing challenges has always been to find a pipeline of bankroll projects, uh, meaning like those projects located in the like politically unstable and also like economically uh, struggling countries, either small or big, um, is gonna impacting the overall take from Chinese uh, investors and Chinese financiers eager to um, invest and to build those projects. So I think the demand, uh, the demand and the host countries' environment, both politically and also um, their uh, legal and governance environment, uh, matter a lot in influencing and in influencing the, how they get the, rip the benefits from the US and China um, dynamics uh, to, um, get the, uh, to get both the ESG benefits from those um, either like um, B3W or BRI projects, however you term it. Thank you, Sarah. Um, that's about all the time we have. So I'm gonna turn it over to James. There was one question about how to get in touch with us. We are all, Sarah, myself and Jackson are on LinkedIn. So feel free to add us. Thank you so much. Um, a big thank you to Jackson, to Sarah, and to you, Earl. 
um, for helping when I say uh, shed light, not shed heat. Um, I think that no matter what, um, you know, the, that China and US, we have a shared future on this planet. And whether America feels comfortable with the fact that China is growing um, and becoming, you know, a bigger presence on this planet, we have to get used to that. And we have to figure out a way forward. And I think that um, having discussions like this about important topics um, is, is a really important component to that. And I'm very grateful to you, Jackson, to you, Sarah, and to you, Earl, for helping uh, shed some light on a really important initiative and um, helping in increase the awareness and the, le you know, the depth of uh, understanding. So um, I encourage everybody here to follow us, to see what's up, follow the calendar, and to join. And a big thank you again to Jen Ching, to Aaron, and to everyone here. Wish you all a really great day or rest of your evening. Thanks, thank much, you. everyone.